Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Liz Kalisulo, Vice President Media. And on behalf of everyone here at Renmark Financial Communications Inc., we want to thank you, especially to those of you in Toronto and surrounding areas, for joining us today for our live virtual non-deal roadshow. It gives me great pleasure to present to you FPX Nickel Corp, who trade on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol FPX. Presenting to you today is none other than Martin Turen, President and Chief Executive Officer. And now, Martin, without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Thanks so much. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. It's uh, it's uh, good to be with you. Thank you for, for tuning in. So yeah, I'm Martin Turen. I'm CEO of FPX Nickel Corp. We are a Vancouver-based company uh, focused on the advancement of a very large scale nickel deposit located in central BC. We think what we have is going to be one of the next generation of major nickel mines that get built in the coming, what we view as a super cycle for base metals generally, and also for, for nickel specifically. So yeah, FPX, again, Vancouver-based company focused on the advancement of a land package in central BC we call the Dekar Nickel District. Dekar is host to the Baptiste deposit, and it is also host to other showings of nickel that we believe could contain, could represent additional uh, nickel deposits of the scale that we've already defined at Baptiste. Baptiste was defined uh, in a recent PEA completed in September of 2020. And the results of that PEA show that B, uh, Baptiste could be one of the largest nickel mines in the world. It would produce around 100 million pounds of nickel per annum, which would make it one of the 10 largest nickel operations in the world and, and has a resource base to support that rate of mining for over 35 years. PEA also showed that we would have very low operating costs at around $2.74 US per pound of nickel produced, and that would be within the bottom quartile of the cost curve for the nickel business. And finally, we see the opportunity to develop Baptiste as a very green, very low carbon emitting nickel operation. As we look out at the landscape for nickel demand going forward, and the importance of clean nickel going into electric vehicle batteries, we think this is a very important strategic distinction for, for Baptiste. The overall corporate strategy here is to continue to advance and de-risk the Baptiste deposit for its pre-feasibility and ultimately into a definitive feasibility study for the construction decision. At the same time, there's also an exploration aspect of our story. As I alluded to, I think within the Dakar land package, we see the opportunity to delineate other very large scale nickel deposits. So we think the Dakar district could end up being uh, BC's uh, answer to Sudbury ultimately in the long term in terms of uh, the nickel endowment and the quantity of annual nickel production that we think can be generated from our, from our project. Uh, this slide just gives an overview of the nickel market going back to 2006 and the red line showing the average annual price of nickel over that period of time and the blue bars showing a surplus or deficit in the market. And what you can see is sort of the last 15 years of, of the nickel market here in the snapshot is you had a price spike and nickel really uh, coincident with the Chinese uh, commodity driven super cycle in 2006 and 2007. That led to um, a, a significant increase in supply as a response to that increase in price. However, what we saw is beginning in 2016, the nickel market switched into a period of long term structural deficit. The onset of COVID has resulted in likely uh, surpluses in the nickel market in the near term. However, in the medium to longer term, we see the nickel market returning to a period of long-term structural deficit or shortfall, where demand will exceed supply by significant margins. And you can see that going on into 2023 and 2024. What that means is a couple of things, a couple of implications, potentially. One, uh, it implies that uh, the nickel price, um, all things being equal, has the potential to go higher in response to that supply-demand dynamic. And secondly, and most importantly, it suggests the world needs to start building new nickel mines uh, in order to meet that supply shortfall. So the question then becomes, which of the companies with uh, nickel projects um, at, at, at the EA stage or later that are capable of going into production in the next cycle of nickel mine construction? And that's where we think uh, FPX and our Baptiste deposit fit in. Very briefly here, just on the history of the project, a lot of nickel uh, deposits that you will see in the market have been around for many decades and have sort of been rinsed and repeated through multiple uh, nickel up cycles going back in some cases to the 1950s and 60s. What we have at Descartes is still a relatively new discovery. The first drilling at this project was done in 2010, while the project was held in an option agreement with our former partner, Cliffs National Resources, the, the multi-billion dollar US uh, iron ore company. 
they advanced the project quite aggressively and delivered a PEA in 2013, at which point uh, they ran into some balance sheet difficulties. In 2014 and 2015, they were forced to divest a lot of their non-core holdings, including their, their interest here. So at the bottom of the nickel market cycle in Q4 of 2015, we were able to buy the asset back for pennies on the dollar versus what Cliffs had spent to earn their joint venture interest. And uh, FDX was able to reconsolidate 100% ownership at that time. The project is located, as I noted earlier, in central BC, uh, northwest of Prince George. And we're located 80 kilometers west of Mount Milligan, uh, which is a large-scale belt tonnage copper gold operation that's been in production for several years. And we're 200 kilometers north of the Blackwater project. Blackwater is now owned by a company called Artemis Gold, previously was owned by New Gold. Uh, and when New Gold was operating the project, the feasibility study that they based their permitting on envisioned a large-scale operation very much akin to what we have planned at Baptiste. And so when Blackwater received its federal and provincial environmental assessment certificates in 2019, we believe that set a very strong precedent for the ability of, of FPX to ultimately uh, permit and put uh, mineral deposits at our Dakar district in, into production. The, the land package here is vast. The Dakar really is a district scale play. Uh, at the bottom of the image, the southern end of the image here, you see the location of the Baptiste deposit. As I mentioned earlier, that's one of the largest nickel deposits in the world. In fact, one of the 10 largest nickel deposits uh, with over 6 billion pounds of nickel uh, contained in the resource. The other targets that are shown here, the B target, the SID target, and most intriguingly, the VAN target, have a high potential to host mineral deposits of the same style of nickel mineralization we find at Baptiste. And we're particularly excited by the exploration potential at the VAN target, which actually has a larger footprint of lateral outcropping mineralization at surface than what we find at Baptiste. And the grades at surface at VAN are, are higher than what we see at Baptiste. However, the VAN target has never been drilled. And in fact, 2021, we'll see the first drill program in the project's history at this VAN target, which we believe has strong potential to be potentially larger or potentially higher grade than the Baptiste deposit and add a second sort of world-class nickel ore body to the land package here. So that's something we're quite excited about in terms of catalysts going ahead here in 2021. This image just gives a sense of the mineral resource estimate that was done in concert with the production of the PEA in 2020. What we see here is the area of higher grade mineralization Baptiste is really centered in the southeastern portion of the deposit. You have a trend, generally speaking, of increasing grades as you move from the northwest to the southeast of, of the Baptiste deposit. And that area in the circle there uh, was an area uh, represented in, or delineated by drilling that we actually did subsequent to closest departure from the project. So subsequent to Cliffs leaving the project, we've continued to drill and step out at here at Baptiste and find that mineralization is actually increasing in grades. And so adding tonnage and importantly, adding higher grade tonnage is what allowed our 2020 PE to have such a robust um, economic uh, profile. Mineral resource estimate, as I alluded to earlier, you can see between the indicated and the inferred uh, categories, there's, over six, there's about 6.8 billion uh, pounds of nickel contained. Uh, again, making in this one of the 10 largest nickel deposits in the world. Important to note that about 80% of the resource already sits in the high confidence indicated category. So there's a uh, high confidence around this resource uh, and one that doesn't require a significant amount of infill drilling to take the resource to the uh, pre-feasibility study phase. Style of mineralization here is rather unique. This is neither a sulfide nor a laterite. The nickel at Baptiste and at Descartes generally is hosted in a nickel iron alloy called a werolite. Those are the small reflective grains that you may be able to see in the image of the core on this slide. Those grains are a pure metallic alloy of nickel and iron, three parts nickel and one part iron, as I said, in alloy form. While the head grains here at the deposit would appear compared to most sulfide uh, laterite deposits to be relatively modest. The key advantage of a werolite hosted nickel deposits is the very simple nature of the metallurgical recovery. And that's driven by the highly magnetic characteristic of this alloy mineral. The next slide here shows the uh, flow sheet. Uh, and unlike most nickel sulfide and nickel laterite flow sheets, which tend to be quite complicated and involve a lot of you know, very expensive machinery and cases of some deposits, very complicated metallurgy leading to very low recoveries with the wear weight that we've defined here at Baptiste. 
we see a very conventional process using off-the-shelf technology and a very straightforward two stages of recovery based first on magnetic separation and secondly on flotation. And from flotation are yielded two potential uh, saleable products. The first is a nickel concentrate, a very, very high grade nickel concentrate rating between 63 to 65% nickel and about 30% iron. We also produce in an iron ore concentrate as a byproduct. Uh, this byproduct we believe has high potential to add significant uh, byproduct revenues to the project. However, it's important to note that the recent PEA included no credits for that uh, for that iron stream, um, as we have further work to do to establish the marketability of that product, but it represents sort of latent potential upside to, to the economics of the project. This very simple flow sheet leads to the production of a very high value nickel concentrate. As I alluded to, the nickel concentration is very high, around 63% nickel, 30% iron, there's also about 1% cobalt. It's important to note that aware white deposits will only form in host rock that is relatively starved of sulfur. Uh, and so what that leads to is the production of a concentrate that has a very clean profile, very low sulfur content and very low content of any penalty or deleterious elements like mer mercury, arsenic and selenium. Why that's important is it allows us to produce a product that can bypass the smelting industry and be sold directly to end users in either the stainless steel market or the electric vehicle battery market. That gives us as a, as a prospective producer of this concentrate a huge amount of market power where we could sell to both of the main markets that are that are users of nickel, bypass smelters and the typically punishing payment terms that they offer to nickel miners and sell directly to end customers and get premium payability uh, with full flexibility to sell either to the stainless market or to the EV battery market. Why is that important? Well, it really comes down to payability. As with all base metals, Typically, nickel miners sell uh, are beholden to smelters in selling a concentrate. And the payabilities for this concentrate, particularly in the mar nickel market, can be quite punishing, as I alluded to. Uh, the nickel miner often just has to simply accept whatever the smelter will offer with very little flexibility to find alternative customers for their products. We believe that the ferro-nickel product that we produce here at Baptiste will yield premium payability very much in line with other ferro-nickel products that are produced by some of the major companies in the world, like Thale and Anglo-American and Cell32. And that means significantly more revenue to our bottom line vis-a-vis -vis what uh, ty typical uh, nickel miners can, can typically count on. We've also done work uh, over the last couple of years to demonstrate that we can produce nickel in a form that is suitable for the electric vehicle battery market. That is nickel in the form of nickel sulfate or NiSO4. And our testing that we've done here with Sherrod Technologies at Port Saskatchewan in Alberta has shown that we have a path to producing nickel sulfate that does not, does not require a smelting stage and does not require the high pressure acid leach or HPAL that has been infamous for capital overruns in the nickel market. And as such, we see a path here to producing nickel sulfate um, in some very significant quantities for the battery market in a way that we think could be very cost advantageous from both a capital standpoint and from the standpoint of uh, operating costs. As I mentioned earlier, we completed a PEA on the Baptiste project in September of 2020, 2020 about uh, five months ago now. Uh, that study yielded an after-tax net present value of over uh, US $1.7 billion. And an after-tax internal rate of return of 18 years uh, with a payback of four years on a mine life of 35 years. So for a project of this scale, these are very attractive economics and position us well vis-a-vis -vis the competition. And I'll, I'll speak further to how we compare in the peer group of, of nickel projects here in a moment. You can see here from an operating cost standpoint in the PEA at US $2.74 per pound shown by the green star here on the left-hand side of this cost curve uh, that we would sit in the bottom quartile of the cost curve. Uh, we would have good margin protection throughout the, the nickel price cycle, which can tend to be very volatile. You know, we've seen the nickel price move between, you know, a high of $24 a pound and a low of $3.50 a pound over the last 15 years. And uh, with operating costs below $3 a pound, the PEA shows that we'd be profitable throughout that, that cycle, which, which, is, which is critical. One of the ways that we like to think about our project and like to characterize the sort of its strategic value is by way of measuring its, uh, uh, its, its we call our, the strategic value index. This is the ratio 
of the mine life to the uh, payback period. This ratio is a very handy way to compare differing mining projects of different mine lives, different commodities, which is what we've done here. So this is a collection of large-scale global base metal projects, anywhere between the PEA and the definitive, a definitive feasibility study phase. And what we can see here is that uh, Baptiste ranks very highly on this scale. A 35-year mine life and a four-year payback yields a ratio of about 8.8. .8. And you can see some of the projects, the projects that are ahead of us on this list are either housed within multi-billion dollar juniors or have already been transacted upon and acquired uh, in, this, in this most recent uh, cycle of the last two or three years. So we think this positions us not just as one of the best nickel projects in the world, but in fact, it's one of the base, best base metal projects. Period. Despite the very strong kind of economic profile shown in the PEA, we still feel as if we're kind of very much undervalued against the peer group. This is a, a metric showing the price over net pre present value for various uh, base metal project developers, again, developing projects typically at the PEA or the PFS stage. And what we can see is that companies at this stage, typically their market cap represents about you know, 15 to 20% of their overall project value. However, at today's market capitalization for FPX of in the range of 130 million uh, to 140 million Canadian, you can see that we are trading at about a 0 0.06. So, so our current market cap represents only about 6% of our project value as shown in the study. So we think there's an opportunity here for a significant re-rating as the project gets better uh, known in the market and as we continue to advance and, and de-risk it. I alluded to earlier, one of the key elements of this project is the ability to produce nickel with a, from a very green standpoint, with a very low carbon footprint. We've provided disclosure to the market in recent weeks, estimating the amount of carbon dioxide emissions for every ton of nickel produced from Baptiste, which is shown on the left-hand side here of this, of this uh, chart, versus the other different types of nickel production currently in the world. And you can see that at 2.4 tons of CO2 for every ton of nickel produced, we would have arguably the cleanest, greenest nickel operation in the world, and certainly the one with by far the lowest carbon footprint. Why is that important? We know that the, as the world's governments move towards um, uh, you know, honoring the Paris, their commitments under the Paris Accord, uh, that has forced mining companies to consider how they can develop their, their mining operations to ultimately be carbon neutral. And you can see the major companies in the world uh, from a mining standpoint have all made commitments in that regard. We also see that um, the governments around the world are gonna start to impose limits, uh, not just on emissions, but on the carbon footprint attached to electric vehicle batteries. So in December, the EU, the Euro European Union announced that they will be imposing maximum limits on the amount of carbon emissions associated with the production of every EV in the European Union market. So above some certain threshold, producers of EV batteries will not be able to sell uh, their batteries into the EU market if the carbon footprint associated with the production of that battery is over some is over some specified maximum. The strategic importance then of producing nickel in a very low carbon way, as we believe we can here at Baptiste, uh, just really strengthens our, our position and our strategic position in the market to have a premium product that we think will be hotly contested for and hotly um, uh, sought after by uh, consumers in, in the EV market. And so that's a trend I think that bears watching for all mining projects is the carbon footprint associated with production. We think it's important to be, uh, of course, low on the cost curve for nickel production, but it will also be almost as important to be low on the carbon curve. Beyond that, we also see the opportunity here, given our unique mineral mineralogical uh, properties at Baptiste, to develop this as even potentially a carbon neutral mine. So the carbon emissions that I just showed you on the previous slide are the gross carbon emissions associated with mining and processing activities at Baptiste. Our tailings at Baptiste, based on research we've been doing at Trent University and at the University of British Columbia for the last several years, shows that our tailings will actually act as a natural carbon sink. It will actually naturally sequester CO2, capture CO2 from air and, and form a carbonate mineral to lock that carbon dioxide away in mineral form. And so we, in the coming weeks, expect to have more news regarding this, um, uh, some test data to demonstrate the potential for significant amounts of carbon capture at our operation to potentially one day making this uh, not just a low carbon project, but in fact, 
a project that could be carbon neutral. So what does 2021 hold for us? Uh, really, we're, we're advancing on dual tracks here. Uh, the first is continued development of Baptiste, ultimately towards the completion of a pre-feasibility study. The focus in the short term there will be principally twofold. The first is metallurgical uh, test work, which we're about to embark on here in the coming weeks to uh, validate the assumptions, the metallurgical assumptions in the PEA, and to seek to, uh, some paths towards optimizing um, those PEA results from a recovery standpoint. That will lead to the potential production of nickel and cobalt products on a test basis for uh, market evaluations by uh, battery makers and other market participants in the EV battery supply chain, and additional work uh, from an environmental and geotechnical standpoint to support the ultimate assumptions that would go into a pre-feasibility study. Parallel track to that, we're focused very much on exploration and discovery. So we have a, a maiden drill program at the Van Target plan for this summer. Um, and whilst modest in terms of the meterage to be drilled, this mineralization lends itself to proving up tonnage very, very quickly. So we see the potential from an initial drill program at Van to potentially prove out world-class discovery on the basis of, of just 10 miles. So that's something that we're very excited about. And again, we don't think that the market gives us any kind of credit for that exploration upside uh, at, at the project. It's something we're very much focused on. Uh, in summary here, I always like to speak to the capital structure of the company. It's something we're quite proud about. Um, you can see here the share price chart going back to 2016. Uh, and, and, and we've seen a nice sort of lift in our share price over the last six or seven months. There, we have currently about 8, 181 million shares outstanding. This company has been public on the TSX Venture since 1996 and has never done a, cult, a rollback or consolidation of stock. Uh, so we've, we've, we've done a very good job of really limiting the amount of dilution over time, even through very difficult markets, um, uh, particularly in the 2015 to 2019 period. Importantly, when we were raising money over, over that period of time to continue to advance the project, we did not issue any warrants. There are no warrants outstanding on this stock. And so no kind of cap, we believe, on where the share price could go, given continued good results and, and continued strong uh, nickel pricing going forward. And perhaps most importantly, management has a very significant ownership stake. So management and board members own over 21% of the company, and that number has been growing steadily over the last several years. So it shows, I think, a very strong alignment that management has with uh, with day-to-day -day shareholders, both retail share shareholders and institutional shareholders. And it's something um, that uh, really, I think, just shows our commitment to managing this project and this company with prudence with respect to how we spend money and, and, and really focus on adding value uh, towards what we think is the ultimate exit point for shareholders, which will be ultimately selling this project to a major company and, and really benefiting from what we see as sort of coming sort of super cycle in the nickel market. With that, I'll conclude and I'll pass it back over and, and uh, happy to field any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Martin. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have now moved into the live question and answer portion for today's virtual non-deal roadshow. Your first, why is now the optimal time to advance the Baptiste Nickel project? It really speaks to the supply demand fundamentals. You know, the nickel market had a period of, of long-term low pricing and oversupply. And that that has led to that led to an uh on, on occasion has led to uh difficulties for nickel producers to actually our nickel developers to actually raise money to advance their project. What we see now is an opportunity where there's more and more publicity around nickel, more interest and more, more understanding that the nickel market is facing a period of long-term structural uh, shortfall. And as such, you make hay when the sun's shining, it would be, it would be the saying that I would kind of fall back to. When the nickel market was in a period of low pricing and access to capital was more difficult, we were very disciplined. We moved the project forward at a very kind of modest pace. As the market opens up now and seems more supportive of, of advancing projects to this scale, we can now be more aggressive. And so I think companies sometimes make the mistake of forcing things and trying to advance too aggressively when the cost of capital is too high. Uh, and that's certainly not, not, not our approach. Um, and, and, and so now that we're seeing a more reasonable cost of capital out there in the market, we think, we think it's a good opportunity to go ahead and, and advance things more aggressively. Would the Baptiste project be viable without the iron ore byproduct? Oh uh, yes, absolutely. I think the PEA clearly demonstrates that. Again, the PEA does not include any credits for that iron ore byproduct. So anything that we can define there and delineate uh, from an upside standpoint 
in future uh, in future stages of study, for example, the pre-feasibility stage, there could be an opportunity to include that byproduct revenue. And we think that would only sort of supercharge the economics here. But clearly, I think the PEA shows that that that, that Baptiste is robust on the basis of the nickel product alone. Do you have an expected timeline for when you expect to confirm the feasibility study projections and the presence of the resource? Yeah, so on the resource, the resource at Baptiste is already quite high confidence. I alluded to about 80% of the resource is already in the indicated category, only 20% in the inferred. So it's just a little bit of infill drilling that would be required there. On the pre-feasibility study, we haven't confirmed or committed to timing on that yet. That will be a sort of a watch this space. In part, it depends a little bit to be honest, on what we find at the van target. If the van target shows is proves to be larger and or higher grade than, than Baptiste, uh, it could potentially alter our kind of development plans for, for what we would delineate or what we demonstrate in a PFS from, a, from a, a deposit standpoint, incorporating potentially pieces of both Baptiste and what we might hope to, to delineate uh, at, at that van target. When do you expect to announce drill results from the van target? We'd hope to begin that drilling at some point in the early summer. If this recent field season and the experience of other junior companies in getting drill results is any indication, uh, it could be that those drill results are kind of available by the latter part of the year, but we would certainly push to have them available by kind of, um, you know, late Q3 or potentially early Q4. However, that's going to be very much dependent on lab turnaround times, which we all know in this market has been. Uh, a bit of a challenge. Can you please provide more details about the pilot plant testing? The metallurgical test work that we're about to embark, it will be pre-feasibility uh, study type of metallurgical test work, and it will include the first ever sort of pilot scale demonstration. So the, the test work that was done in support of the, of the previous PEA was at the bench scale on very representative core sample material of around 600 kilograms. The next stage of metallurgical test work will include pilot work on about a three ton uh, bulk sample. Uh, uh, and that will be a composite of drill core from various parts of the ore body. So very much kind of representative material of multiple phases of the mine plan. We have a high confidence that that, uh, that initial pilot scale work will demonstrate and, and confirm the assumptions that were delineated as part of the DE stage uh, test work. And importantly, as I alluded to during the presentation, it will allow us to produce some degree of con- some amount of concentrate, which we can then take forward into processing for uh, those EV battery products, both from a nickel and a cobalt standpoint. So it's quite an exciting program, and it's one that lays the groundwork for all the assumptions that would go into a pre-feasibility study. Which of these two markets, stainless steel or EV battery, is more profitable? It really depends on, uh, well, profitability ultimately depends on what you can sell the product for and what your cost structure is. So the PEA demonstrated or was focused on the cost structure for producing a product for the stainless steel market. The PEA further showed that we could get sort of premium payability by selling a very high value product directly to the stainless steel market. Now, if we produce a product for the EV battery market, that will entail a little bit of additional cost, and that's something that we're starting to get a handle on right now in some of our internal studies. But we think it it represents significant additional revenue. So the Pricing premium for production of nickel sulfate, which is the chemical that goes in the EV batteries, is significantly higher than than the input price that is paid for nickel going into stainless steel. So one of the sort of trade-off studies that we'll be doing here as part of the pre-feasibility study over the coming months is understanding what is the sweet spot for us from both an operating cost standpoint and a payability standpoint for those two different types of products, one for the stainless market one for the EV battery market, and which one ultimately yields uh, more, most profitability. And that's not something that we can de- answer definitively right now, but as we go forward over the last, next few months, we'll be completing those internal trade-off studies to be able to answer that question. Does FBX have enough cash on hand to complete all the milestones laid out for 2021? We do. Uh, we've got about $5.8 million in the bank right now. And so our work programs are budgeted to be approximately another 3.6 million from from today to the end of the year. So based on our current uh, projected uh, uh, burn rate and expenditures for the company over the course of the year, we should end uh, 2021 with uh, an excess of $2 million in the bank. Is the plan to find another joint venture partner? 
we see the potential for that, certainly. Nickel deposits of this scale don't grow on trees, so to speak. Um, we have seen good engagement with, you know, large scale mining companies. Um, you know, the diversified companies are certainly out there looking for, for nickel products right now. Within their own inventories, they don't have a lot of large scale nickel deposits. They've not really been a focus of their exploration and development activities uh, over the last several years. So certainly a joint venture, a partnership with a group like that is a possibility. However, it's not something that we see as, as necessarily a desired outcome for us in the short term. We have cash enough to continue to advance the project. And our focus is really on maintaining 100% control of this project for at least the next few years to continue to de-risk and advance it and really just kind of see that re-rating to a, a significantly higher market capitalization. And that's something I think that can be accomplished very much within our own grasp, and our own ability to raise capital to be able to, to, to continue to advance this project and, and see what we view as the possibility for higher nickel prices and as real scarcity premium for these types of nickel projects of this scale in this juris in, in as and in as good a jurisdiction as we're located and with the attractive cost profile that we've delineated. Is there a First Nations interest in the Dakar deposit land? And does this create any project risk or complication? Well, First Nations are fundamental partners, I think, for any Canadian mining project. In our case, we have two very strong First Nations partners, uh, Binche Wuken and uh, Kasa Nation. And those are groups that we've had a very long, uh, very positive, strong collaborative relationship with. These are groups that we speak to on a regular basis, and our uh, partnership with them is guided by exploration uh, agreement um, uh, right through to the, uh, to the point where a construction decision is made. We look at that as a real advantage of this project, a very strong relationship. We've been able to form one that's based on a kind of trust, kind of a, a high regard for, for safety, first and foremost, whenever we're doing field work. Um, one that provides employment opportunities for, for those local communities and, and, and work that is done to the highest regard with respect to environmental protection. So this is, this is an aspect where when we see the potential to develop this as a world-class nickel deposit, one that is very, has a very low carbon footprint that can conceivably be a very green operation. This is something that I think is very much of interest to our First Nations partners and, and something that we think adds a lot to the uh, the sort of the attractive profile of the project. Are there any other Canadian companies at the same stage as you with a project in Canada? Yeah, there are. Uh, there, there's a handful. There are uh, companies with projects in the Yukon, uh, elsewhere in British Columbia, in Ontario, and in Quebec. Um, so there's three or four other companies, I would say, with uh, Canadian projects around the PEA to the pre-feasibility study phase of, of, of study. What's interesting, I think, about the nickel market and nickel equities on the Canadian market is there are very few of us. Uh, of course, I think as anyone on the call probably knows, if you want to invest in a gold company, there are literally hundreds that you can choose from on the TSX Venture Exchange. However, if you want to invest in a in a nickel company, there's maybe about a dozen such companies on listed on Canadian exchanges. Um, and so there is a inherently almost a scarcity value to to those companies. And and within those dozen, the ones with sort of very large scale PEA stage or above projects, or you can count them on the fingers in one hand. Who are your comparable peers within the nickel space? Ties back to the last question, I guess. Uh, some companies that we would look at as being uh, comparable and having advanced um, exploration or early development stage nickel projects. Uh, companies like Canada Nickel, uh, Talon Metals, uh, Nickel Creek in the Yukon, as well as Giga Metals as a project in northern BC. So those would be a couple of a few of the, the, the peer companies, uh, some that have a higher market capitalization than we do in some, some of the lower market capitalization. And beyond that, I would look to the Australian market, the ASX listed companies who tend to be more nickel companies listed in Oz than in Canada. In some ways, I, I view that fact as being somewhat akin to what we saw in the gold market a few years ago, where the Aussie companies, the Aussie gold companies were trading in a real premium valuation to their Canadian counterparts. And certainly, as you look down at the ASX listed nickel companies right now, they very much trade at a significant premium to the Canadian companies. What we saw it happen over you know, 2020 is the Canadian gold companies really caught up to their Aussie peers from a valuation standpoint. We certainly see the potential for that for Canadian nickel companies to catch up to the Aussie listed uh, nickel companies here 
um, going forward. Great job on having your project be green. Is there government funding for projects that have a small footprint? Yeah, I think, well, where the government funding or where the government sort of incentive to be green comes in is in one of two ways, broadly speaking, and maybe I might suggest three ways. The first would be with respect to government funding for research to demonstrate and to prove up the green credentials of our project. So, for example, the carbon sequestration research work that we're co-sponsoring uh, out at uh, the University of British Columbia right now is funded in part by a $2 million grant from the government of Canada, the federal government of Canada. And so the government of Canada and provincial governments generally, I think, are, are becoming much, much more supportive in about providing financial resources to demonstrating sort of the path to a low carbon future. And that's something we, we certainly plan to take advantage of going forward. Uh, secondly, uh, with respect to carbon sequestration, to the extent that we can demonstrate significant amounts of carbon sequestration at this uh, at this project once it's in production, we see a path to potentially getting uh, paid a carbon credit uh, refunds uh, for every for every ton of of carbon uh, that we would sequester in our tailings. We'll be able to develop, I think, a strong case to get a refund of any carbon tax we, we might have paid on any of the inputs, for example, on the diesel inputs into the mining fleet. And thirdly, we think that the development of low carbon uh, uh, metals that are fundamental for the green energy future, for helping Canada to meet its uh, obligations in the Paris Accord, we think that creates conditions that from a permitting standpoint may make a project like that piece ideal and should very much factor into regulators' decisions around the permit permittability of projects, again, that are delivering you know, the essential minerals that we need, metals and minerals we need for uh, the clean energy future and doing so in a responsible fashion. Further to that, can you speak to FPX's current ESG strategy, if there is one? Yeah, I mean, ESG is, is fund has been fundamental really to our exploration of the car from day one. You know, that really starts first and foremost with consultation and engagement with uh, local communities and principally the two First Nations groups that I alluded to earlier. And that's a core there of that social engagement to ensure that those groups are comfortable with our work plans and that they're provided opportunities to uh, feed into those planned work activities and to participate with, them, with us on the ground and actually executing those work programs. With respect to governance, you know, I think uh, our, the way that we have uh, always operated uh, from a financial discipline standpoint, our discipline around chair dilution speaks to a very strong governance culture within the company. And finally, in environmental uh, aspects, you know, we're focused here on the extraction of, of nickel from a very clean host rock source, and doing so in a way that we think can have a very low carbon footprint. So continuing to, to research that, continuing to push on the ability to develop this as a very low environmental footprint operation is fundamental. And I think it's, it's going to have to be the way that junior mining companies advance these stalls of the the, the, their mineral deposits going forward. Do you lease the land? So the land is owned by the Crown. It's owned by the provincial government. Uh, it's used principally right now at surface for logging activities, actually. You know, there are a remarkable amount of logging trucks that go in and out of this area, which provides us great access. Uh, certainly, we're not spoiling pristine wilderness here. There's a tremendous amount of, of clear-cut activity in our region. Um, and so we own the mineral claims for mineral exploration. But the land itself is owned by the Crown, as would be typical with a lot of other mining operations in this part of the Columbia. Can you comment on what you perceive to be the biggest overhang on the stock? I don't know that there's any overhang. There have been overhang in the past in that we had some debt on the balance sheet, debt that we'd incurred to acquire the asset back from Cliffs way back in 2015. That debt is now being uh, settled, and so that we are a debt-free company. That, I think, arguably was, was a bit of overhead resistance. Um, there, having debt on our balance sheet was not ideal, but we're through that now. Uh, warrants, again, no warrants, and so that doesn't represent any overhang. I guess if you, if you thought about overhang more broadly, you might think about sort of the ability of a, of a company of our size to be able to bring a project of this scale forward right through production. And that's certainly a legitimate question. It's not really our strategy to think that we're ultimately going to raise the capital required to build this project. So I think, you know, in time here, as our market cap increases, that will become more and more of a possibility. Really, this is all about de-risking a world-class asset and ultimately selling it to a larger partner, uh, um, whether that's a mining company or, frankly, a downstream user. 
we think that the world of possibilities is really opening up in that regard, particularly given the importance I think that battery makers and automakers are placing on security and supply of critical metals like nickel. We don't have to go out and raise all of that money, I think, to build this project ourselves in order to see sort of a value moment or a, a sort of an exit strategy for shareholders. I do think that at some point, a project this big, this well located, and this with this uh, green profile and this low cost profile, ultimately, whether we like it or not, it won't sit in our hands forever. And well, ladies and gentlemen, that now concludes the live question and answer portion for today's virtual non-deal roadshow. And now, Martin, just before we let you go, I'm going to hand the floor back over to you for final remarks. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And thank you for the probing questions there. And, and certainly invite people to reach out to Renmark or to me directly at CEO at fpxnickel.com if you have any further questions. Those emails come right to me and I'd be happy to answer them. So again, it's CEO at fpxnickel.com. We've got a very exciting year full of catalysts here in 2021 ahead of us. You know, the share price movement we've seen over the last six months has come from relatively little in the way of news flow. Uh, really, it was just, you know, publishing that PEA, which was the major catalyst for us last year. This year, we envision several more catalysts, uh, each of which we think has the potential to kind of add significant value to the project. And given the kind of the tight share structure and the the high degree of insider ownership here, we, we see the conditions here for continued uh, potential price appreciation. So thanks for your attention. I look forward to uh, connecting with you all again at some point. Thank you very much. Now, once again, is Martin Turin, President and Chief Executive Officer of FPX Nickel Corp, trading on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol FPX. My name is Liz Kalisulo, Vice President Media, and on behalf of everyone here at Renmark Financial Communications, Inc., thank you once again for joining us, especially to those of you in Toronto and the surrounding areas. Please stay tuned for other presentations in your area, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, take care of yourselves, be well, and we will all I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye now.